Welcome back to the Joe Miller Show, KOAN Hot Talk, 1080 AM, 95.1 FM. We have Charles Seiler on line with us. He's from the Foundation for Government Accountability, been very active in the anti-Obamacare efforts. He serves as the Media Relations Director for the Foundation. And that, by the way, if you're not aware, is a D.C. policy group focused on responsible health care reform and policy. Uh, before joining the FGA, Mr. Seiler served as the External Relations Manager for the Goldwater Institute and was also critical in the successful passage of the Right to Try bills in Colorado and Missouri. It helped create major media coverage there. From 2000 to 2008, conducted public affairs missions around the globe with the U.S. Army, often supporting the Department of Defense, State Department, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Mr. Seiler, welcome to the Joe Miller Show. Hey, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on, and uh, I always love when I get a chance to talk about Alaska politics and how national issues uh, end up affecting Alaska and stuff. It's a good day for me. And every once in a while, issues in Alaska affect the national scene as well. Right. <laughs> we tend to be a microcosm of the things that happen elsewhere, but that's for another discussion, maybe another day. We, of course, have this major decision, King versus Burwell, that came down. We had one guest on earlier in today's program talking about the decision. Uh, it shocked a lot of people, shocked a lot of observers. I mean, we had a guest on from Heritage earlier this week who was convinced that the Supreme Court was going to strike down the subsidies right. to those states that did not have exchanges. And, in fact, Congressman from maybe your district, certainly your state, Gosar, had proposed, mm-hmm. already had drafted a bill to fix the thing once the Supreme Court struck down the subsidies provision. But that's not mm-hmm. what happened, is it? Not at all. And and you're right. It, it, even though I'm personally not a, a legal scholar or a, or a, a fortune teller, uh, all of the experts seem to think that the court was going to rule in favor of the plaintiffs and declare the IRS subsidies illegal just based on a plain interpretation of the law. And uh, and even some of the lower courts had even made reference to, you know, a plain reading of the law would side with the plaintiffs. But uh, as we've seen, the court decided to take an activist role and really just instead of uh, playing, you know, they're doing their part as the neutral arbiter, uh, they decided to get involved into politics and, and make a political decision to save the act despite the law that Congress had passed. And, I mean, this is one of the reasons that just inflamed uh, Justice Scalia, who just uh, he just tore into the, the decision uh, in his dissent. And one of the things that he said that just makes it so clear what happened, he said that words no longer have meaning if an exchange that is not established by a state is established by the state. And he said that under all the usual rules of interpretation, in short, the government should lose this case. But normal rules of interpretation seem always to yield to the overriding principle of the present court. The Affordable Care Act must be saved. And that's what they did. They just wanted to save Obama's signature law and keep Americans trapped under this disaster. You know, especially when you have no reasonable justification for the decision. This goes way off line from what you're here to talk about. But, I mean, these justices have become a law unto themselves. And there has to be. There are parameters of action, right? I mean, they've taken an oath to the Constitution. And yet, right. I, and even even the modes of interpretation that I disagree with, they aren't even applying those. They're just going out there and doing whatever they want. Justice Scalia, later in his dissent, called it pure applesauce. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, I, I, and, I wonder if you have to be a genius or a fool to understand the, the mental gymnastics that are going on to to, to give them the, the justification that they're seeking to, to, you know, to sort of base their decision on. He gave this analogy. He said, imagine, this is Scalia again, imagine that a university sends around a bulletin reminding every professor to take the interest of graduate students into account when setting office, office hours but that some professors teach only undergraduates. Would anyone reason that the bulletin implicitly presupposes that every professor has graduate students so that graduate students must really mean graduate or undergraduate students? Surely not. <laughs> I, I mean, and, that, and that's exactly what they did here. I mean, they took words that meant one thing, and they expanded them to a different definition, and they had no legal justification to do it. I mean, these justices ought to be impeached. That's my view of it. <laughs> well, I mean, they're definitely, they're definitely using uh, Bill Clinton's dictionary when it comes to, to what words mean. And, uh, and they've demonstrated that, like I said, time and again when they upheld the, the penalty, uh, saying that it actually does mean a tax. So it is legal, even though President Obama had said that it wasn't a tax. And you know, so they were able to flip flop there and uh, and save the law. So they're just continually bailing it out to the point where even 
again, Philly had called. He said, we might as well just call it SCOTUS care at this point. And in all honesty, <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that, I missed yeah, that. They, That's they, great. They might as well. Yeah, they might as well. I mean, the, uh, uh, President Obama has done less to keep this, this law uh, afloat than, than, you know, Chief Justice Roberts and, and his cohort of uh, colleagues there. But the sad truth is that um, with this decision, Obamacare, I mean, nothing's changed. Uh, the real disaster is, is that it's not that one side lost and the other side won. It's that Americans are really looking for relief and looking for reform. And Obamacare is still the same disaster today that it was yesterday afternoon before this decision uh, came down. People still are struggling with skyrocketing out-of-pocket costs, whether it's higher deductibles or higher premiums. Um, employers are still struggling uh, to work employee hours so they can avoid you know, incurring the, the uh, expensive employer mandates. And so that's having a negative impact on our economic recovery and, and employment opportunities for, for people who want to work. Um, the, the disaster just continues, and all we're seeing is, is D.C. values uh, that are being pushed by a small cadre of people, whether it's you know, in political office or behind a judge's uh, bench, just pushing these values on the rest of the country. Right, yeah, uh, the, the, the elites are doing it, and yet the people are not behind what they're doing. Uh, you mentioned during the break that there's some mm -hmm. really pretty convincing polling out there about where the people are at on SCOTUS care. What, what do those yeah. polls say? <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, the Foundation for Government Accountability had actually polled uh, uh, voters in federal exchange states, and we actually even went so far as to exchange, uh, or sorry, to uh, the poll exchange enrollees. So these are the people who were potentially going to lose their subsidies if the Supreme Court ruled in uh, favor of the plaintiffs. And even before the decision came down, they said, you know what, we don't want the subsidies saved. We want to see major reform uh, on this law. We want to see Congress take action to do, you know, to do what it takes to make changes that improve things for everyone. And uh, so with that, I mean, when you look at that, and we've also seen a uh, Three, over 350 lawmakers from uh, 33 different states uh, sending letters petitioning Congress to, to take up Obamacare and reform that. Uh, this court's decision doesn't change any of that. The political will for reform and repeal is still there. I mean, this has been Congress's mess. People blame Congress more than any other group for this, although who knows after today. I mean, that might change. But, uh, but people want Congress to take this law on and to reform it and to start to, to put some choice back into the health care decision and get President Obama and, uh, and the feds in D.C. out of the, uh, the, the room with you and your doctor. Yeah, I mean, it's a disaster, and until the decision-maker is the patient, and that so often is the problem. You've got all these different entities that are in between you and your provider. You, you don't have the type of cost-benefit analysis that's going to drive down cost. I've always been a firm supporter of expanded health savings accounts, you know, portable. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't, if you don't spend it, you don't lose it. I mean, there are a lot of different simple fixes that can be put into effect that it could help get us back on track to having the best health care system in the world. But the way it's headed, I mean, you don't even have people. My son right now is prepping to go to medical school. I mean, that's, I don't know whether the demand is the same that it's always been. I, I can tell you the practitioners that he's talked to and that I've talked to, a lot of them are very demoralized. Many thinking about early retirement, some already preparing to get out of the practice. They're just very frustrated, not just with Obamacare, but right. to much of federal interaction interface with the healthcare system. It's just an increasingly well, frustration, seemingly designed to harm health care, not to actually improve it. Well, that's what happens whenever the government gets involved in, in really anything. I mean, they're just not situated to make choices for people. It, at best, they should be uh, taking on policies that encourage or, or foster choice because then people can actually make the decisions that, that best impact them. And, and sadly, like you said, I mean, this law has been uh, – I mean, it's been just as bad for health care providers as it's been for patients or taxpayers or even, you know, state leaders. Everybody's hands are tied and everybody's being told what to do uh, from someone behind a desk, you know, 3,000 miles away. And that's just not the way to get the best results. And you're, you're absolutely right. It will never drive down costs with any, without any kind of price sensitivity. Obamacare completely discourages the simple types of things that states could be doing uh, to, to address rising cost issues. And so uh, it's definitely time to open the law, start to start to get rid of it, and allow the states to, to start making positive changes that will actually help people. 
If we have just about a half a minute left. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charles, what can people do to engage and help correct this problem? Well, the, the thing that you can always do is contact your legislators. Um, so if you uh, reach out to your congressmen, your senators, uh, let them know that you want to see these reforms. Also, work at the local level. Look at, look at your state uh, legislators. Let them know that you don't want more Obamacare. You, you don't want any of these provisions. And, and let them know you support them calling out Congress. All right, Charles, I appreciate you coming on from the Foundation for Government Accountability, hitting SCOTUS care, as we all should. <laughs> appreciate it, Charles. Everybody <laughs> engage. So Make sure you let your voices be heard. Stay with all us. Right, we'll be back care. with you in just a minute. 